Okay? Now, open up your materials to uh, the last page, the second to the last page. At the top it says, expressing how we are and what we would like. And it says under A, think of someone who does something that makes life less than wonderful for you. So this person that I'm asking you to think about, who's presently behaving in a way you're not crazy about, and what I'd like you to do is answer this question. Write here one thing that the person does that you don't like. We're going to work on one specific action that the person does that you don't like to get you familiar with the process today. Maybe the person does several things, but we're going to show you how the process works by showing you how to communicate with the person about one specific thing they do. So write under A one thing this person does that you don't like. Now when I was uh, here in San Francisco working with the school system back in the 70s, the superintendent of schools asked me to go into an elementary school. He said the parents are complaining about the quality of relationship between these teachers and the administrator. They said the tension in the school is so great that the parents want to take their children out of the school. So he asked if I would go in and see if I could open up better communication between the staff and the administrator. The plan was I would meet first with the teachers and then get the teachers and the administrator together. So in my meeting with the teachers, I started with a question that I just asked you. I said to the teachers, can you tell me one thing that the administrator does that makes it hard for you to work with him? I was asking for an observation, a concrete behavior. What is one thing he does? The first teacher to respond said this. He has a big mouth. <laughs> now can you see the difference between the question I ask and the answer I got? I did not ask, what size mouth does the principal have? <laughs> so this teacher was giving me an evaluation, an analysis that implies wrongness. You see, we've been so trained to think that way that sometimes we can't separate fact and opinion. We, all we see is our enemy image. See, whether it's an individual or a nation, we have been trained to think in enemy images, wrongness. And it, it obscures reality. We, we don't see the behavior, we just see our enemy image. In his book, Out of Weakness, Andrew Schmuckler says that when cultures are taught to think this way, not to just see the person, but to, an image, a judgment they've made. Bombs are never far away, you see. So I pointed this out to the gentleman that this was not an answer to my question. I wanted to know one thing the principal did. This man was stuck. He, he, he just couldn't get it. The woman sitting next to him tried to help. She says, well, I know what he's referring to. I said, okay, help him out. What, what's one thing that the principal does? He talks too much. No, too much is a judgment. I ask for an observation, not a judgment. See, this, this is how jackal-speaking people think. They really have been brought up to think there is such a thing as a just right amount of everything. And too much and too little and that they know what it is, see? So they think that way. It doesn't make resolving conflicts too easy with them when people have an idea that there's a right and a too much and a too little and they know what it is. And especially when they mix it up with an observation. I was just asking, what does the person do? And again, for the second time, this person couldn't see the behavior separate from the judgment. A third person tried to help. Well, I know what they're talking about. Okay, what? He thinks he's the only one that has anything worth saying. No, telling me what you think he thinks is an evaluation you're making of what you think is going on in his head. I was asking for what does he do? 
a fourth woman said, he wants to be the center of attention all the time. I said, now you're giving me a judgment or a diagnosis of his motives. Even if it's accurate, it's a diagnosis of his motives. It's not an observable behavior. My question was, what does he do? Now the entire faculty sits there quiet. Nobody can answer the question. And one of the women said to me, boy, Marshall, that's hard to do. Yes. In fact, the philosopher Krishnamurti says that to observe without evaluating is the highest form of human intelligence. You see. So those of us who have been taught to think in these enemy images immediately, to think right, wrong, good, bad, normal, abnormal, appropriate, inappropriate, to this, to that, we can't see reality. All we see is our enemy images. Well, with great help, with, uh, with great effort on my part, I finally got them to get rid of the images and answer this simple question, what does he do? There was several things, but the one that they wanted particularly to start working with him on was this, that during their once a week faculty meetings, regardless of what was on the agenda, he would relate it to a war experience or a childhood experience. And the average meeting lasted 20 minutes longer than it was scheduled. Okay, that answered my question of what he did. did. He talked about war experiences, childhood experiences, rather than sticking to the agenda. I said, have you called that to his attention? And they said, well, we can see now that when we tried to talk to him about it, these other judgments get mixed in and he gets defensive. So they thought it would be a good idea to talk to him about it, but they asked if I would be at the meeting just in case. <laughs> so I attended their next staff meeting and I saw rather quickly what they were talking about because Almost as soon as an issue came up, the principal would say, oh, that reminds me of a time, and he would start to tell a story. And I was waiting for somebody to confront him on this in giraffe, but instead of that, there was a lot of nonverbal jackaling going on. <laughs> People were going like this, rolling their eyes, <laughs> poking the person next to them, <laughs> yawning, <laughs> looking at their watches, holding the watches up to the ear. <laughs> and I watched this scenario going on for a while and I said, <clears throat> excuse me, but isn't somebody going to say something? Now there's a silence and the man who spoke up in our first meeting, I could just see him getting his courage up and he looks at the principal and says, Ed, you have a big mouth. <laughs> So let's see if whether what you wrote down answered the question I ask. Is it an observable behavior or did you mix in any evaluation? And my two friends here will help us to make this evaluation. Um, this animal has been taught uh, to, somewhat like a police dog to sniff out narcotics. Uh, if there's any jackal mixed in, he will howl. If you answered the question, this animal will dance. So sir, what did you write down? My dad blames my wife. Oh! For my choices. He does what? My dad blames my wife for my choices. Yes, blames is a, is a judgment. See, that's already putting me evaluation into it. Dad, do you see yourself as blaming her? No, I see myself as calling attention to the facts. So see, <laughs> dad doesn't see that as blaming. No, I'm educating. Thank you, dad, yes, okay. So. How do we say it? See, we need a direct quote. We need to give it, to make it an observable behavior, we need to say, my father says, what? All of his problems. You are responsible for all of his problems. He says this to the wife. You are responsible for all of his problems. That's it. Yes, okay, that's a direct quote. That's what he says. That's giraffe language. You made a direct quote, okay? See, as soon as you in see, have the word blame in your consciousness, it's going to change the whole energy with which you approach the person, because you're basically making a judgment of them as blaming, which everybody knows is wrong. So. Yes. I have the mic. Oh, <laughs> Lately, my son is not doing his history homework. Mm -hmm. Okay. My dad makes harsh 
harsh judgments and insulting remarks. Oh my God, you've killed my poor jackal. <laughs> He could have handled the harsh, that was one judgment, but insulting, harsh and insulting, you know, see, you know, those are two judgments that... Actually, he does use insulting words. No, there is no such thing. After today, in fact, seriously, by 4.30 this afternoon, you will never hear another insult. It won't exist. Insults will not exist. I'm going to show you to use some technology today that takes insults and criticism out of the waves, airwaves. So that no matter what your father says, you can never hear another harsh statement or another insult. Because we're going to show you today how to use this technology. <laughs> <laughs> and with this technology, it will be impossible for you to hear criticism, harsh remarks, insults. With these ears, all you can hear is the only thing human beings are ever saying. Please and thank you. See, that's all. We're going to show you today that all what used to sound like criticism, judgments, blame, are simply tragic suicidal expressions of please. My brother yes. yells at me to get in the car to go to school, and then he makes me late to school. Who yells? <laughs> see, <laughs> but you see, yells, yells is a uh, kind of a little bit of an evaluation. He, he speaks in a tone of voice. Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's Go a ahead. tone of voice. I was asked at Lincoln High School. Is, is there Lincoln High School in San Francisco? Yeah. Many years ago, I was asked to work with the faculty there. They were having a lot of tension amongst the faculty uh, racially, ethnically. There's a lot of Tensions. And the superintendent asked me to work there, and I started the day asking, tell me something that somebody else on the faculty does that you don't like. Man turns to the woman next to him and says, I don't like it when you yell in our faculty meeting. She says, who yells? <laughs> now, she was from a different culture than this man. See, what was yelling in her culture was quite different. And about 10 minutes later, when she started to yell at him by her own definition, I saw a difference, you know. <laughs> so raises the voice when he's asking you to get ready for school. Yes, yes. yes. Or just kind of gets angry at me to get in the car. Well, gets angry, uh, that may be accurate, but it's a diagnosis. We don't know whether he's angry. He might be scared that, you know, you're going to miss school. Yeah. <laughs> it might sound to you like angry. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But raises the voice, has smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> <laughs> That you can see, you see, that's observable. Yes? Uh, fifth grader, uh, Jesse refuses to do his seat work. Oh! Refuses is a diagnosis. Maybe an accurate diagnosis, but it doesn't tell me what he does. It, it, he just says, no, I don't want to do it. Says, no, I don't want to do it. That's the behavior. My husband doesn't tell me things which will affect me deeply. Okay. It's the first jackal husband I've ever heard of. <laughs> this is a new, a new experience for me today. A student in my class incessantly talks loud, won't stay seated, or keep his hands to himself. I hear about three judgments in there. Uh, let's go over it slowly, because I hear three diagnoses. Say it again, so we'll hear the three diagnoses. Incessantly talks loud. Loud is uh, your interpretation. Louder than you would like. If you want to say it, put it that way. Louder than I would like. Won't stay seated. Won't is a diagnosis. Doesn't stay in his seat after I've told him to. He might in the future. We don't know whether he will or not. So that's a diagnosis. Doesn't at the moment. Doesn't when I ask him to stay in his seat. And does not keep his hands to himself. And does not keep his hands to himself. Mm -hmm. OK, 